And thank you very much uh, for inviting me to present the work that is yet to occur uh, of this new DBP that was funded. And I'm so extremely happy to be part of the IDESH uh, family. Um, when I was being recruited, I've only been here about a year and a half. When I was being recruited, I met with uh, Lucilla as part of my recruitment. And here I am one and a half years uh, later being part of this wonderful team. So um, the project that I am going to present uh, is a partnership uh, between UCSD, that is uh, me as the CIPI, with um, my colleague, my very good colleague, Dr. Ian Komaneka, who is in uh, the Phoenix metropolitan area, and he is a surgical oncologist, and we've been working together on the AIA by National Breast Cancer Study for several years. Oops. Sorry. Okay, so just as a little bit of background, this is nothing new to the, to the audience um, in terms of informed consent for biospecimen sharing and data sharing is, is extremely cr critical in the area of um, uh, human subjects research. Um, and as was discussed this morning, and I'm reiterating some of that, um, the obtainment of informed consent for such collection is, can be extremely complex and challenging. But even more challenging is when we involve individuals from underserved populations who maybe don't speak the language, the English language, have cultural issues that may enhance or prohibit the participation. Uh, and so this is an area that there's even less known and that we definitely need to um, address. Um, and then importantly, um, there is a perception, some is justified and some is real, that individuals from underserved populations will be less likely, that should say, should be less likely to share their biospecimens than other groups. Um, but there are some data to support this, but not in all groups. We can't treat all underserved groups as one. So I'm going to share a little bit of that information in, in the background. And obviously, the goal here is for all individuals in our society to share of the success of our science, right? Especially in the area of precision medicine. We want to have representative samples uh, in our biorepositories to be able to do that. Without that, we're not able to move forward. So an, an issue for, for this DBP, as well as for uh, science overall, is to enhance and simplify the informed consent process. Uh, so that participants make a truly informed decision when consenting, as was discussed this morning. So some of the issues that um, were discussed and that will continue to be discussed is the delivery method. Is, are we done with paper now? We're moving to more of an electronic uh, video productions to uh, get uh, better uh, informed consent. Is the method or the consent itself language and culturally appropriate? And then one area that um, some of us uh, have been involved with, and Dr. Komaneka himself, is the issue of health literacy. So even individuals with adequate education do not have adequate health literacy. It's like me reading a legal document. I just turn and everything gets blurry, and I don't know what's being said in that legal document. I'm not um, educated in the process. So the same thing here for uh, health literacy. And then for us specifically in this DBP is who delivers the consent? Does that make a difference? So just to share a little bit of what exists out there in terms of um, biospecimen um, sharing, there is a bit of information on knowledge and the understanding about the importance of sharing. So formative work, focus groups that have uh, been conducted, um, some like, like the one that uh, Dr. Ono Machado presented this morning, um, and then the use of, uh, um, of existing or stored biological specimens. What do, what do we know in there? There, has been, there have been some reports, not a lot though, okay? But in terms of this area for uh, data among racial and ethnic groups in underserved populations, there is work, again, from small, probably select studies of select participants and the understanding of the informed consent. What is understood? Is it understood that this is voluntary, that you can withdraw, that kind of thing. And then as I uh, alluded to in the previous um, slide, the issue of trust in these communities is important to ascertain. So we know about issues of trust for research overall among African American communities. And then perhaps some of you are not aware of the Native American uh, communities. Um, I came here from Arizona, so I work very much with Native American communities. And on the reservation, for example, on the Navajo reservation, um, research is 
allowed, a very um, involved process to get a research study going, but there's a moratorium on collection of biological samples, okay? So think about what we're trying to do here. That is not possible on the Navajo Reservation. In the Tohono O'odham uh, Nation, which is the reservation closest to the Arizona Cancer Center where I used to work, there's a moratorium on all research. Okay, so those are the communities where the issue of trust is, is, is very, very evident and very common. But for Hispanics, which is the major population that we're going to be working with, that issue may not be there. Um, and th we don't have enough data to say yay or nay, but there isn't a Tuskegee, there isn't um, a, a precedence for it. So maybe that issue is not there, and maybe this isn't as huge of an issue in Hispanic populations. So the data that exists for racial ethnic groups in published uh, literature um, mainly focus, with some exceptions, on an individual's willingness to provide the sample, not whether the provision was made. So are you willing to provide a biospecimen? What are the issues that you want to address in order to provide and to allow us to store your specimen? There is some information on that, but in terms of the actual provision of these samples, that is a separate issue. So let me just show you a couple of um, studies that have been published in this area. This is a, a fairly large study that was published a few years ago. And uh, right away, the, the selection or the select population is there because this was conducted among blood donors. So these are individuals who already um, are, are blood donors. So, but the, the, the investigators analyzed a very, very large uh, national um, you know, two studies of blood donors and asked whether the individuals were willing to allow their specimens to be stored, okay, and, and used in future research. And we see here that although, um, so first of all, largely a Caucasian population, 85%, but because the sample is so large, it allows for the um, analysis by racial ethnic group. In terms of the overall, I think it was 91% that people said, yes, you can, you can store my sample, right? But we see that there are differences by racial ethnic groups. So here we have the odds ratios of allowing um, researchers to uh, store the samples using Caucasian as the reference group and then all the other racial ethnic groups being compared to Caucasian. If the odds ratio is less than one, that means that they're less likely or less willing to allow this. So we see here that um, African Americans and Hispanics about equally less likely to say that they would allow the, the storage of those samples, and that's pretty substantial. That's 50% less likely. The confidence intervals don't include one, so that's statistically significant. Um, Asians, um, they, there was a lower likelihood, but not statistically significant. So here are the two prominent groups where we see the differences. And then importantly, and something that we need to tease out, is it race, ethnicity per se, or is it uh, other factors, associated factors, such as education? And what we see here is when the investigators looked at um, this, um, um, this factor or this, um, this issue by uh, education using the highest educated group as the reference group, um, we see here that those with less than high school education were significantly less likely to allow that uh, provision. Um, it would be interesting, I think, with this large number to see whether within each racial ethnic group whether education made a difference, but the investigators didn't do that, but I thought you know, this would be an opportunity. Okay, the next uh, example that I'm going to provide is um, one that just was just published this year by a Chris Lafredo from the Lombardi Cancer Institute. Um, and this is a, a small study, but it was focused on foreign-born Latinos, and this is why I felt that it was very relevant to what we're trying to accomplish in the DBP. And basically, the investigators wanted to describe factors associated with knowledge and intention okay, to provide biospecimens. Again, the issue not whether they provided them, but whether they were knowledgeable about it and whether they would allow that. And the population were 331 foreign-born Latinos. This is in the Washington, D.C. area from Central and South America. Um, results here, very quickly, 47% knew what a biospecimen was, um, and 67% said that they would provide a biospecimen after given information about what this involves and what its purpose and just getting more information and being informed about the process. And related to the, the question that I um, raised in the previous slide, 
individuals within this population with higher education were more likely to say that they would provide biospecimens. So even within a racial ethnic group, individuals with higher education were more likely to say that they would provide biospecimens than those with lower education. And importantly, medical mistrust was not related to provision. That question was asked. So this I get at the issue of is mistrust or lack of trust an issue for this particular um, ethnic group? All right, so to, um, to move on to the DBP that uh, we're about to launch, uh, the specific aims, we have two specific aims. The first one is to compare informed consent for biospecimen collection and data sharing for research. And we want to ask whether the cons if the consent is delivered by a physician versus the consent being delivered by a non-physician that is a research assistant. It makes a difference, okay? Um, and the consent will be delivered electronically via a tablet. And we also, these are secondary um, aims because we're not statistically powered to, to do them, but we like to be able to assess some of the trends. Does the consent, um, uh, informed consent vary by age, race, ethnicity, health literacy, cancer risk perception, language, uh, and whether the uh, participant has a breast cancer diagnosis or not? Here are the methods. Again, uh, we are um, conducting this study in uh, the Phoenix metropolitan area in a county hospital, the Maricopa Integrated Health System. Um, MIHS serves a, a quite a uh, racially and ethnically diverse population. And being a county hospital, a safety net hospital, they face a great deal of challenges uh, accessing healthcare, extremely fragmented. Uh, but MHS has several programs uh, where, uh, where they show that they are committed to providing culturally and linguistically competent care to all who enter its doors. The study will be conducted in the Breast Center, which is led by Dr. Ian Komaneka. He is the director of the center. The center serves about 900 patients per year, um, and about 9 to 10 new breast cancers are diagnosed each month at his center. And here are the characteristics of the patient population. As you can see, a lower um, um, educated group with the mean uh, years of education 10.5, less than 50%, have less than high school education. Here are the SES uh, characteristics, 33% are unemployed, the mean household income is uh, very low, and 90% are uninsured or on uh, Medicaid, and 3.5% are on Medicare. And we see that there is diversity in terms of race, uh, race ethnicity. 67% are Hispanic Latino women, 20% are non-Hispanic whites, and 9% are black or African American. So this reflects the population of um, uh, central Arizona. And 53% are non-English speaking. So continuing on with the methods, we propose to recruit 140 women over the time period of the pilot uh, study. We plan to randomize 70 to each arm, that is 70 to uh, um, Dr. Komaneka providing or uh, getting the informed consent, and 70 to someone else. The eligibility criteria, 18 years or older, English or Spanish speaking, and these are participants or patients, sorry, who are coming to Dr. Komaneka for care for some kind of breast problems, so those that are undergoing biopsy for any reason. And our plan is to uh, show the participants a short video, uh, once they um, elect to uh, be part of the study, about the benefits of consenting to biospecimen and data sharing for research, and then, um, and then um, uh, be randomized and then uh, deliver the informed consent. The outcome measures are, again, participation rate by randomization arm, and then the differences in participation according to the characteristics that I mentioned earlier. The tissue that we plan to collect is uh, um, paraffin embedded, formerly fixed paraffin embedded uh, uh, tissue from the breast. This could be cancerous or non, and then obtain a saliva sample for uh, genomic DNA. The data that we will be collecting, obviously, are sociodemographics, um, uh, cancer risk perception, uh, based on some work by the, the published work that is noted here. And then, um, as I said, Dr. Komaneka um, is has, um, very, very interested about what his patients understand. So the way I, the reason why I started Got to know Dr. Komaneka very well is because of the study that uh, we worked on previously. But one of the things that he notes 
and continues to note is he's very concerned about what his patients understand when he speaks to them, okay? So when he delivers the consent for the biopsy or what have you, he says, I don't know what they understand. And sometimes they do something different than what I think they understood. So obviously that patient provider communication. So he himself, this is the breast surgeon in a county hospital, has taken upon himself to start collecting his own data with collaborations with the researchers such as uh, myself and others. And one of the things that he's been collecting is a health literacy. Um, he has like a database of like 1,500 women where he has health literacy and is starting to look at health outcomes related to that. So he uses the newest vital signs um, um, instrument and so we'll continue to um, we'll collect that. And also a motivation reservation uh, for specimen and data sharing questionnaire, short questionnaire that we plan to develop. So in summary, um, the conduct of this pilot study to compare physician versus non-physician delivery of informed consent for biospecimen and data sharing will be um, take place among underserved women in a safety net um, healthcare setting. Uh, we feel that this project um, is perhaps a first step, but essential for addressing the need of biospecimen repositories that will include individuals from diverse populations. Thank you very much. Yes, I'm taking questions. Any questions? So this is something that we will be developing with, with uh, Lucilla, and um, it, it hasn't been developed, but I, our plan is to discuss both the risks and, and benefits of the consenting process. What does it mean in terms of privacy? All these issues that were brought up this morning, the, the patient or the participant, we feel has to be very well informed about what it means, because I think that Doctor, I wish I, I should have put a picture of Dr. Komaneka because Dr. Komaneka has that very pleasing, charismatic face and personality, and he's very proud of the fact that for every study that he has participated in, um, he has nearly 100% participation rate. And that involves biospecimen collection, uh, genetic testing for BRCA, what have you. And so the issue is, He's concerned about it. Am I giving all the information, including the risks, to my patients? Is there something I'm missing? Is there something that I need to provide more of to be able to, for that individual to make a proper informed consent? So yes, including the risks will be essential. Um, is, is he the one actually getting the consent as the clinician? And then yes. you're gonna have a research assistant? So yes. will you match the research assistant? Characteristics so, to the doctor? Match in terms of? Age, to him or to the patient? No, to him. To him. See, this is a safety net hospital, so I, my, my feeling is that the resources are so poor that whoever is available that day who is a non-physician, I mean, I don't think we can, we have the luxury of doing that. This is very poor resource um, setting. So he has a, a, a nurse practitioner, for example, that I have a feeling will probably get involved, um, and other research assistants that are rotating for other projects. So, but, you know. Yeah, that's a very good point. We'll, we'll have to do a tally with Dr. Komaneka to see who are likely to be available. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>